at Kennedy School of Government. And she was also recently awarded the MacArthur Genius Grant for her amazing work on inequality, health inequities and solutions for reducing them. So please welcome me. Uh, please join me in welcoming Marcelo. And we have a real uh, hybrid keynote because she's going to be joined online by Amitabh Shambra that you all know from uh, also from the Harvard Kennedy School and in, here in person by Nat, Matt Nododowidigo. Do Good? No? Not a week, no. Who's here from the Booth Healthcare Initiative? So thank you, Anna. That's all. I'll, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, well, Mar Marcelo can take it away. I just wanted to use this final opportunity here since it's our last session to, to thank Lipo, thank uh, Fiona, thank Craig, uh, thank Luigi, who are they they were all they did all the work behind the scenes to put this together and they've been working on it for over a year and a half uh, because COVID just kept delaying everything. So thank you all for everything. And you, are, you already gave Marcel an introduction, so I won't say much else except to say that I'm, I'm really excited that we've had the chance to be working together over the last several months. Um, I've been a member of the Marcella Alson fan club for, for many years. Um, so it, I feel a little bit like I did as a teenager when I had this like an indie band that I really liked that then becomes really popular. And I, and I, feel, I feel I have like mixed emotions because I'm happy for the success, but I sort of want everybody to know that I was there first and I, and I deserve <laughs> some credit for that in, in some weird way. Um, so I, I really enjoyed working with Marcel over the last few months. Um, we've been working with an industry partner, uh, potentially getting some randomized experiments uh, off the ground, which I think is gonna be really exciting. And I, I just, I couldn't help myself but sharing this story that one of the senior scientists we've been working with said that um, he's worked with several Genius Grant recipients before, but Marcel is by far the nicest one. And I just think that's a lovely sentiment. Um, I, I really admire Marcella's creativity and work ethic, but, but also her kindness. So please join me in welcoming Marcella. Thank you so much. That is so incredibly generous. And I, 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 um, I hope to live up to those, um, to those very, very generous words. Um, so it's an honor to be able to speak with you today. Uh, racial inequality in the United States in healthcare is vast and nuanced, and I can't possibly do it justice. Um, so my more modest goal is just to provide some facts, some context, findings from my own research. And then I hope we'll have time to discuss the, um, the linkages between IO and health uh, inequality more broadly. So this figure is from Leah Bustan and Bob Margot's chapter on racial differences in health, a long run perspective, and shows life expectancy at birth from 1900 to 2010. The dark line represents black or non-white groups before they were disaggregated, and the gray line represents the white group. And all groups have dramatically increased life expectancy over time, yet there was not a single point in time in which black or non-white life expectancy equaled or surpassed that of the white group. And then also black and white life expectancies have converged, but there have been periods of both stagnation and even reversals. And unfortunately, we're currently in one of those periods. So the COVID-19 pandemic has erased at least 15 years worth of progress closing the black white life expectancy gap. This figure is from the National Vital Statistics Report released in February and it shows that while life expectancy declined sharply for all Americans, the burden was not equal. So life expectancy for both Hispanic men and non-Hispanic black men declined by well over three years. So that puts black men's average life expectancy at 68 years now followed in order by black women, Hispanic women, and then decline of about two years for white men and 1.3 years for white women. So white women are an average living about 80 years, so a 12 year life expectancy gap between black men and white women. Along with Amitabh Chandra and Kosali Simon over the summer, we published a piece in the Journal of Economic Perspectives documenting the initial health effects of COVID-19. And the panel A is just the crude COVID-19 mortality rates. And you can see some disparities emerge there, but they really start to widen when you age adjust. Um, and that's because Hispanic and black populations skew younger. Some of that is due to increased fertility, but for black populations, it's also due to increased mortality at younger ages. And then when you look at that last panel, that's when we see um, you know, the gradients really start to emerge between black, Hispanic, AIAN, and white populations. Here we're looking at a measure of premature mortality, which years of potential life lost taken from the public health literature, which is counting all the years of life, 65 and under, that um, are being lost due to the pandemic. Um, so for the rest of our time together, I thought I'd spend a little bit of, um, a little bit of it 
reflecting on the history of economic thought with respect to race. Um, and then given a little bit of input on my own work on Tuskegee and then diversifying the healthcare workforce. So uh, this is a Journal of Economic Perspectives article by Thomas Leonard, which details the pervasive influence of eugenic ideas during the formative years of the economic profession. As Leonard recounts, a substantial share of AA leaders were deeply involved in the eugenics movement. Leading figures in the discipline, such as the founding president of the AA, Francis Walker, blamed the disadvantaged circumstances of Black Americans and many immigrants on poor genetics and capabilities and advocated sterilization and other measures to avoid dysgenic breeding. Walker attested that to eliminate poverty in the US, quote, a wholesome surgery and cautery must be enforced to, quote, strain, drain out of the blood of the race more of the taint inherited from a bad and vicious past. Now, eugenics and the science of race became associated with Nazism and lost popularity following World War II. Moving into the 20th century, ec economists began to embrace preferences as causes of differences, though they were often sometimes still appealing to race as the, as the foundation for those differences and preferences. George Stigler, the founder and namesake of the center, has made seminal contributions to the economics of information, to the theory of oligopoly, to the analysis of regulation, and of, um, of course is incredible uh, in, for that work. However, in the midst of the civil rights movement, Stigler, who was president of the AEA in the mid-1960s, penned an article in the New Guard magazine in 1965 contending that while Black Americans indeed had suffered prejudices was not the principal cause of their disadvantage. Quote, no amount of restitution for past injustice could solve the basic problem of the Negro, that on average he lacks a desire to improve himself and a willingness to discipline himself. And further, quote, the Negro is excluded from more occupations by his own inferiority as a worker, again, on average. Stigler went on to argue that whites don't want black neighbors, not because they are prejudiced, but because black Americans on our average are bad neighbors, a, quote, loose, morally lax group. In short, the principal drivers of racial disparities, according to Stigler, was that black Americans' exogenous preferences drove group differences on average, a word he used four times in this short essay and very consistent with the eventual model of taste-based um, discrimination by Phelps. I'm sorry, of statistical discrimination by Phelps. Um, and also the taste-based discrimination uh, by Becker, I'll, I'll talk about as well in a moment. So the inadequacy of these models has recently been called out in the wake of the BLM demonstrations. Following the murder of George Floyd, Professor William Spriggs of Howard penned an open letter to economists stating, Quote, economists are viewed as objective scientists, presumably absent passion, but if you start with a model that has race as exogenous, racial differences cannot be objectively approached. The model begins with a fallacy that assumes racial differences as a natural order. In addition, the standard models, taste-based statistical discrimination, they're all from the vantage point of the discriminator, and they neglect the role of institutions, culture, and those different interactions. So, um, another JEP article penned by sociologist Mario Small and my uh, late colleague uh, Deval Pager, they write a substantial body of evidence suggests that limiting the study of discrimination to the, acts, to the actions of potentially prejudiced individuals understates to the extent to which people experience discrimination and the extent to which discrimination may account for um, social inequality and may play a role in markets. So I want to just uh, kind of take some um, information from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, who have kind of convened several working groups on social determinants and health more broadly. And I think the, the thinking here is really that race is not, um, race is defined as a social inter interpretation of one's phenotype. And social interpretation is really important. And if you look at the history of what constituted a race historically versus today, I mean, there used to be many, many different races of Europe, for example, um, in the 1900s and differences in um, intelligence based on size of brains were um, uh, studies that were done there. So differences across race and health outcomes should not be generally interpreted as due to genetics, but due to racism. And racism operates on multiple levels. So there's individual prejudice and, and there can be internalized discrimination. And then of course there's institutional racism and the rules of the game um, that come across in, in laws and, and the like. So with that, I thought I would talk about uh, one of my own studies on in, kind of a case, thinking about it as a case study in institutional racism, which is um, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Now, as Matt noted, a, a lot of the time I do do randomized trials, but this was an instance where you'd never actually want to 
randomize medical mistrust. And unfortunately, in the United States, we have many instances of exploitation of, of disadvantaged groups, particularly Black Americans. So historically, physicians were arguing that, in fact, slavery was justified because it helped because of the genetic inferiority of Black Americans. And so this would be a way to, um, to treat them almost like children, to, to care for them because they couldn't be trusted to take care of themselves. Um, that's, uh, and in fact, there was even a, a diagnosis, drapedomania, which was the thought, um, which was uh, uh, the, the wanting to actually escape slavery. And the treatment for drapedomania was whipping. Um, and so that's on the left-hand side. There's Marion Sims. He's on the bottom. He um, was the, quote, father of modern gynecology. How did he figure out the speculum? And how did he learn how to, um, how to do surgery to repair vesicular vaginal fistulas? Well, he operated without anesthetic on women who were enslaved dozens of times. Um, there's Henrietta Lacks on the right-hand side. I think most people know her as well as the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. So that's the official title of the study. It tells you three things off the bat. The study is going to take place in Tuskegee, Alabama. There are people who have syphilis and they won't be treated for it. And, um, and it's gonna focus specifically on black men. So along with Marianne Wanamaker, we hypothesized the study took place from 1932 to 1972. So you can think about the studies that we do. Can you imagine a study lasting for um, decades. Uh, it, it, during that time, um, about uh, out of the 400 men, um, about a third of them lost their lives, 40 of them affected their wives, and 20 infants died of syphilis. But what were the effects beyond the, the, um, of the disclosure in 1972 by the press to people that were beyond um, the actual study? That's what we tried to look at um, in our econometric analysis. So we hypothesized that the disclosure event in 1972 increased medical mistrust, um, and therefore depleted utilization and health outcomes. And we thought that that would be true, particularly for those who most nearly identified with the deceased study subjects. So we used a quadruple difference framework. We, um, we leveraged the fact that there were differences in, you know, it was targeted for black men, it was disclosed in a particular year, and then we used two continuous proxies for um, pr proximity to the study. One was just geographic, how close were you to Macon County, Alabama? And one was the share of black migrants during the Great Migration from Alabama. And both of these um, basically reveal the same result. So beta one is the coefficient comparing um, black men to, to white men, near versus far, before versus after, on a close to Tuskegee. We see drops in utilization, um, which we don't see, if you will, in a quote, placebo test for white men versus white women, or for black women versus um, for black women versus white women in that beta three coefficient, and when we look at this from the perspective of a table, we can see you know drops in outpatient visits. Those account for about a twenty percent drop in any outpatient interaction, whether it be telephone visit or in person visit. We see also a drop of about for one standard deviation closer to Tuskegee, about two point five percentage points on any outpatient visit. Inpatient demand is more inelastic, so we see less of a response there. But interestingly, and this is really our only measure of severity, is we see an increase in the number of nights in the hospital, about 0.5 nights, um, which suggests that people who are coming to the hospital are coming in a more severe state. Uh, in terms of mortality over the decade or so following, which we were able to extend our analysis, so we see an increase in mortality of about 1.1 death um, per thousand uh, per year. And lastly, we see that most of these, um, most of this negative effect is occurring among those that are less educated, those black men that were less educated. And again, those were the men that were recruited into these studies to begin with, um, the sons of sharecroppers as they were described. So I have to say that on a personal level, this was extremely depressing uh, to research. A lot of stuff, you know, as long as our papers are in economics, they're never kind of long enough to put in all the qualitative research that goes into it. And the archives were just extremely disturbing because this whistleblower had tried to get things changed inside the system. He had been ignored. And in fact, what they had done instead, the CDC, the venereal disease unit had had a meeting and closed a meeting, in which case they said that, you know, it had become a political problem and what they needed was cover. And so they reached out to the local branch of the AMA and they received um, the county support for it. And then they kept on going. It, that's what led to um, the whistleblower finally going to the AP. 
Um, but even though this was historical event, I felt like there was still qualitative research showing medical mistrust was very high. And in a setting like this, what are the proposals on the table to try and bridge that trust and, um, and try and improve particularly um, uh, preventative care take up for, for black men? So these are organizations that have been talked about a lot, um, some of them a lot. Um, so the AMA, the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the National Academies of Medicine, they all have these statements you know, these normative statements on how they want to make the, the healthcare workforce um, more nearly represent the population it's trying to serve. And so we, this is uh, Grant Graziani and Dr. Owen Garrick, who's a physician from Oakland, started this work in this two-stage double-blind randomized um, design at the individual level. So there were the two stages. First, the subjects were introduced to randomly assigned doctors via photo on a tablet. Um, second, um, then they would select preventative service via that tablet. And then they would interact with that doctor in per person and possibly revise their selection. And the reason we had these two stages is because we wanted to test this, if there's really just a strong aversion or maybe internalized discrimination that could have you have a strong preference, just seeing a picture of a doctor of one race or another, we should pick that up um, from, that, from that first stage. But if it's really something about going back to Ken Arrow's you know, 1963 work, it's something about the quality of the patient physician product that they're able to produce together, then we shouldn't be seeing differences until they actually get to interact in person. So here um, is the study design. We, and it was really important for me at least that we didn't use a convenient sample. We didn't use EMR data. We didn't use claims data. We recruited these men from barbershops and flea markets. And that was really important because if there's so much mistrust, you might not even get people coming into the doctor in the first place, or they might be churning in and out of the ER or as we'll see, you know, as you know, many, many um, are uninsured altogether. So we recruited from the community, 1,300, um, 600 of which came, a little over 600 came. Um, we had 14 doctors staffing this pop-up clinic that we ran in Oakland. Uber provided ride-sharing services, so social determinants and transportation are really important. So we wanted to have that not be a barrier for them to come to our clinic. They saw the um, doctor's photo on the tab tablet, and then they could choose between BMI, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, flu, or shots, or nothing at all. Then they interacted with that doctor in person, and, um, and then they could re-optimize. They could re-choose what they, what they wanted. Um, so I'll just jump straight to the results in the interest of time. The top bars show the um, stage one results, and then the top bottom bars show the um, after uh, interacting with the physician results, and what we can see is there's really no large difference between the means of take up um, from just, you know, from the tablet between uh, non-black and black doctors. So patients that got assigned to a non-black doctor or a black doctor, they choose things with um, about the same frequency. And they were attending because you can see that blood pressure and BMI are non-invasive things. Those things are chosen more often than, um, than diabetes and cholesterol, which we informed them required a prick of blood. But when we get down to, and you can see that both sets of doctors are pushing out demand. So if you compare the top gray bar to the bottom gray bar for, for example, blood pressure, you can see that there are gains about 16 percentage point gain for non-black um, non physicians, but it's just much larger, uh, 24 percentage points for black physicians. And those differences increase, particularly when we get into those invasive services like diabetes and cholesterol. And I say invasive with sort of a laugh, because these are not colonoscopies, these are not really, these are small eye invasive things. And so here we're seeing it in percent terms and we see you know, differences of 20 to 30% for the non-invasive, differences on the order of 50 to 70% for the invasive tests. And I won't, you know, I'm happy to talk about this more later, but we kind of probed all these different things. Like we kind of ruled out taste-based discrimination in stage one on the patient part. What about you know, provider-based discrimination? We did tests, we did, you know, all sorts of threshold tests and everything like that. Just the feedback alone would suggest that the doctors themselves were not, uh, were not discriminating. The patients were actually all very happy with their care. Um, but anyway, we came down to communication. We thought that you know, from all of the things that we could see, um, from the data that we could look at, the notes and, um, and the fact that there was heterogeneity and those with greater mistrust at baseline, um, responded more to the black doctors. These things all um, sort of pointed us towards communication playing a key role. Now I've been kind of switching gears and writing more short papers since COVID-19, just trying to respond to the 
crisis and been working with a bunch of physicians and economists, actually Esther Duflo, so development economists, um, marginalized populations are marginalized populations and development economists. So Esther and Abhijit and all of them have been really key in helping push this agenda forward. So when, what about when you can't have two-way communication? You're just trying to do telehealth in some sense, just trying to get the message out. We're uh, randomizing 15,000 participants to different um, messages. This is prior to the vaccine. So just different messages about how to protect um, people. And we're we were finding that in fact, you know, any message from a physician would in, you know, reduce knowledge gaps, which some of my prior research uh, with David Cutler showed these very large knowledge gaps between black and white Americans and what they knew about COVID-19 at the beginning of the pandemic. So any of these video messages could reduce knowledge gaps. For black participants only, messages from race concordant physicians raised information seeking behavior by about 9%. But that was a very small, um, I think very small effect compared to what we saw with the invasive tests and what we saw when we actually had the, you know, the interaction in person. Um, and then this last study that I wanted to mention is work with um, a, a Stanford grad student, Sarah Eckmeyer, um, who, you know, we were really interested in, look, you know, the stock of medical providers is slow to change. It is what it is. Um, what, what, what are the policy options that we have right now available to us? So what if we, and we tested three policy relevant aspects, what we thought were policy relevant aspects of medical messaging, um, varying the sender and the signal. So take a discordant provider, take a, a white provider. What if they said something to acknowledge prior injustice? And in fact, Annals of Internal Medicine was trying to coach physicians about what to say about COVID-19 to minority populations at the same time. We sort of, we had a forecasting, going back to marketing, we had a sort of fork premonition um, that that um, that ended up actually this was this was something that was seriously being discussed um, once COVID nineteen vaccines came on the market. This this project started before that. Um, the second thing is, well, what if you had someone that wasn't an expert, could just in a non inferiority trial? I'm not talking about whether they would beat physicians. This is our prior. Wouldn't they just not be as bad? You know, would they be maybe not um, not that much worse than the experts because you're giving information about the safety and effectiveness of the flu shot. Can we just show that, because we could hire community health workers right now, right? We could, we could do that. That doesn't take a lot of training whatsoever. So we did this in, uh, in two waves and um, we recruited, this was online. We elicited priors. For black respondents, we had them um, either to a black quote unquote perceived expert or a perceived layperson. Um, for discordant centers, this would have been a white provider um, who is perceived as an expert, either the standard signal or that acknowledgement signal. And then we also had a white respondents as well, um, either having uh, expert sig signals that were concordant or discordant. We elicited pr posterior beliefs, intentions to get vaccinated for the mythical uh, COVID-19 vaccine at the time. And then um, we actually did a follow-up survey to see if they got the flu shot. So um, if possible, could you click on sender photos, expert role, racial variation? Uh, the other one first. Yep, thanks. Okay, so that's the level of variation we had between the expert roles. So we hired 10 actors for this. And so we had the exact same script, verbatim same script, the exact same background, the exact same. We tried to balance, you know, obviously on age, but also on facial hair kind of getting a little bit difficult to do. Can you go back to the production process? And now could you go to the sender photos racial concordance expertise variation? And so this was our expertise variation. So again, the exact same sender, the exact same script, just with or without um, the white coat. Okay, keep, can you, thank you so much. Yep, perfect. So, um, so again, these were 40 seconds long. Um, they read this from a teleprompter. And actually we were pretty surprised at the results. So replicating results from earlier, from that earlier work in annals that in fact, if you look on the right-hand side, there's no effect of concordance or discordance for white men, um, which, you know, which we, we, again, we've seen that quite a quite, um, couple of times now. Uh, it seems to be particularly important when it shows up uh, for black men. And then if you think about that left bar on the, le um, the leftmost bar, that's the modal experience of a black male patient. He's seeing a discordant provider. Overwhel it's still an overwhelmingly male workforce. You think about stocks, not flows. 
Um, and, and they are giving the standard message, right? So that, and you can see how much lower the willingness to take up a COVID-19 vaccine is in that group versus the white group. You know, you see that disparity right there. Then when you add um, an expert who's concordant, we're getting a bump. That's the third bar from the, um, from the left, but it's not that much. It's not statistically different. And acknowledgement message actually also increases that willingness at the, you know, which is significant at the 10% level. But the thing that dominates all of these is actually the non, uh, the concordant non-expert, um, which was really, again, very surprising for me. And if you could click on the link heterogeneity by vaccination experience, so, and what we found is that this was really coming from those that we call, quote, never takers. So these are people that had actually never gotten a flu shot in the past. They never attested to it. And in fact, you can see that off, oftentimes it's oppositely signed for those who are recent takers. Um, so, so the signal seemed to be resonating those, for those who were kind of outside the healthcare system. And you also saw um, similar effects with, with um, flu shot, self-reported take up. We can go back now. Okay, so um, the last couple of minutes, I mean, I, I really just, uh, I, this is just me brainstorming and what's really neat to see is how much actual work is going on on health inequality in IO, at least as I perceive it, definitely recently. So, you know, even though the ACA has made a dent in the uninsured, there's still a high share of non-white Americans enrolled in um, who don't have health insurance, or if you can click on insurance by type, we can, we can show them, um, the 19 to 64, right. So this is from Kaiser Family Foundation. You can just see from the 19 to 64 year olds, um, obviously we, we all know that many, many babies that are born to, uh, to patients of, uh, to, you know, black and Hispanic mothers are on Medicaid, but so are these 19 to 64 year old adults. They're on, um, they're on public insurance um, or they're uninsured altogether. So for black individuals, 14% are uninsured and Hispanic 26%. Okay, we can go back. Um, so these statistics suggest that public insurance programs such as Medicaid and Medicare might play um, potent tools to reduce health disparities. And um, two recent papers by, uh, by scholars at Yale, Jacob Wallace and colleagues, um, one published in the, uh, in the Journal of Internal Medicine, if you click on figure to the right of Wallace et al. Um, this was kind of a neat regression discontinuity using BRFSS, showing that at age 65, you can really reduce the blue lines are the share uninsured of um, the black population and the black lines are the white respondents. And you can see these big drops in the share uninsured once they hit age 65 or share without a your usual source of care. And they also see that this coverage led to um, reduced gaps in uh, vaccination rates and self-reported health. Um, they don't have claims data because the claims data really start at age 65. So where's your, where's your 64, 63, if you can go back. And then I, I would also put in, you know, the work by including Paul Goldsmith and Pinkham showing that Medicare also improves financial health in this area. Now, now um, Amitabh talked about this study in the New England Journal. So I think consumer heterogeneity and the elasticity of demand. I think these are things that you, you all are already kind of thinking about for sure. Amitabh mentioned that New England Journal article that showed they partnered with Aetna. They randomly reduced, they randomly um, eliminated co-payments for patients that were coming out of the hospital and needed, you know, blood for their blood pressure, cholesterol, et cetera. And the gains were modest, five percentage point, six percentage point increase in, in adherence. And the gains were the same for white versus non-white populations. But look at the differential health benefit. If you can click on the figure to the right of Chowdhury et al. 1920. So this went, went into health affairs. And you can see that the cumulative incidence of having um, a cardiovascular event, you know, so this is a different elasticity, right? This is the responsiveness of their health outcomes to adherence. And that's because they're on a different part of the curve. The, the non-white population's adherence was much, much lower prior to this intervention than that of the white population. So the elasticity of adherence with respect to the removal of co-pays is the same, but the health benefits are very, very different. And so that's, that's really interesting when we start thinking about elasticity. So you can go back. And, um, and then consumer heterogeneity and competition. In the interest of time, I'll skip over that. And we can just go to the next slide, which is neat. 
Um, this is a really cool book. Um, it's an award-winning book titled Administrative Burden Policymaking by Other Means. Um, and it just shows how complexity disproportionate. I mean, what we've been talking about this whole conference is complexity. And we're learning the rules and we're scratching our heads and we're looking at the slides and we're learning the acronyms. Imagine if you're a single mother or a poor person trying to actually navigate these systems. And your colleague here at University of Chicago recently spoke at our inaugural meeting of the ASH Econ Health Interest Group. He was talking about the disabled, but he said complexity breeds disparities. A high resource individuals, you know, that he says the countable asset limit for SSI eligibility is just $2,000 and that's been unchanged. But 529 accounts can allow families to save for disability related expenses. Unfortunately, the only families who utilize these accounts are the high income families and very few families avail themselves of this overall. Um, how can these inequities be addressed? And I would just put a few things on um, this margin. Uh, one is, I, I, I feel like I'm missing, um, I know I'm missing Neil Mahoney. Neil Mahoney, I wanted to give you a shout out for all your good work on, I, I'm sorry, I went too fast. <laughs> so all your important work on, um, on debt and how that relates to the ACA. And um, I think that really falls into this as well. Um, so complexity can be reduced on the extensive margin through static strategies such as adult um, defaults and auto enrollment. And that's like some of the neat work that Mark Shepard has been doing recently, if we click on that figure, but I can just say it in words that it boosted insurance take up in there, you can see it right there. So this difference in difference, once they suspended audio enrollment, we saw a drop in those that were below the federal um, poverty line in terms of um, their, their um, enrollment in, in, um, in mass health. And so there wasn't an increase in active new enrollment to offset the departure from auto enrollment. We can go back. We could reduce complexity on the intensive margin. So, and this is kind of neat because this is work from both California as well as by in, from Indonesia by Abhijit Banerjee and all, showing that navigators for applications can really help bolster enrollment. And then there's also some nice work outside of health altogether at IRS um, and EITC take up. And then I would, you know, I would like to include Fiona and, and Zach's work on, you know, increasing transparency, because if anybody is going to be surprised by that bill and then not be able to afford that bill, it's going to be those low income providers. And whether it's because they're out of network or whether it's because they thought they were admitted when they're actually just in the observation unit, <laughs> those are all things that are going to hit, ah, this is where I was going to bring up your work now. So um, this is, um, this is uh, the perfect place for that. Um, and so I think, in fact, there's a lot of work going on in inequality um, lately. So and the, the last comments I just wanted to make is thinking about innovation. Um, so innovation is obviously extremely important in healthcare. It's um, one of the major reasons we've seen those life expectancy gains since the middle of the 20th century that we, we talked about. Um, but I think there are important questions, which pro what products are being developed so in my field, I'm um, specializing in infectious disease. You know, we have, we have sort of the opposite. Uh, we have a huge problem because the best, eight, we have a, had a, a drought in the pipeline of antibiotics. It's projected, by the way, that by 2050, there'll be 100 million deaths per year from antimicrobial resistance. So this is a huge issue. Antibiotics are the backbone of modern medicine. You have cancer, you need an antibiotic if you obliterate your immune system to treat cancer. You have surgery, you have to get an antibiotic to prevent uh, having a post-op infection pre prophylactically. So it's, it affects everyone, yet there's no, there's really low incentives for it because the best antibiotics are one that you don't use often because you don't want to breed resistance and you only use them for a short amount of time. And so there's actually an act right now called the Pasteur Act, which is a, I, I'm not going to remember the acronym, but it's, they tortured themselves to make it sound, <laughs> to make it fit with Louis Pasteur. And it's a payment model where you're trying to actually incentivize not for how much is used of the antibiotic, but to incentivize exactly for the public health value because you can't incentivize for use because if you overuse, you're back where you started from, if not worse. Um, recruitment stage, so who is tested? And you know, a lot of trials fail because of low accrual rates. They can't actually get the people they need to fill in the trial. And then what's the composition of those trials? And then I think that actually plays into the dissemination stage. Who's going to take it up? Well, a lot of you know, a lot of the qualitative work I do 
people will say, well, who is it tested on? Was it tested on people like me? In addition to these issues of affordability and cost sharing and um, whether people will get time off from work uh, to, um, if, you know, to, to participate in these trials. So I think my concluding comments are racial health disparities are profound. They've widened with COVID-19. A lot of the work, the literature I live in is about these social determinants and healthcare workforce expert versus non-expert, different racial compositions could help close gaps. But I also submit to you that all the work you're doing is actually already doing is also really important for thinking about health inequality in terms of innovation, regulation, and insurance market design. Um, so I will end there. Thank you so much.